Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today I have with me Penny Zenker, aka the Focusologist. She is an international speaker, business strategy coach, and one of America's leading experts in the psychology of productivity to eliminate distraction, perfectionism, and self-sabotage to maximize results in every area of your life and business. By the time she was 31, Penny founded, developed, and sold her first multi-million dollar business in Zurich, Switzerland. Her first book, The Productivity Zone, was an instant Amazon bestseller, and her TED Talk, The Energy of Thought, has gained international attention and impact with more than 1 million views. She is here now to talk about her book, The Reset Mindset. Welcome to the podcast, the Voice of Influence podcast, Fenny. Well, hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited about this conversation. It's a great book. You've got obviously such a, you've done so much. Your TED Talk is amazing and it's had so much impact and your last book was great. I mean, so this, I'm excited to talk about the Reset Mindset, but um, yeah. I'm curious before we get going, like, what do you want people to, what do people need to know about Penny and why she does what she does? Well, what do they need to know about me? Um, I think they need to know, you know, you mentioned all those things and all those things are great, right? I did this, I did that. And I think the most important thing that they need to know is I'm, I'm just like them. You know, I, I set big goals and I, and I go out to reach them uh, and sometimes I get them and sometimes I don't, um, you know, struggle with focus and attention and, and focusing on what matters most, which is probably why I write about it because yeah. I struggle with it too. So, you know, and on one of my new web pages that I talk about the reset mindset, I very clearly say, I'm still resetting. I'm constantly using this tool to help me to achieve the things that I'm achieving and stay focused because it is more and more challenging than ever. So I think, yeah, that's the most important thing is uh, I'm, I'm just like everyone else. You know, I really appreciate that you just said that because I think one of the things is difficult for people to kind of grapple with when they're trying to decide whether or not to use their voice is whether or not they have the credibility, you know, if they're strong enough, um, it's easy to compare ourselves to others. And so to hear that you're human, just like the rest of us, you know, I think that's very helpful. Totally. I mean, I, I can't even tell you. I mean, I still get nervous before uh, I go on stage. I um, still question, you know, is my content good enough? Like I'm I'm there's a piece of me that's really scared that put this book out is what are people going to think? What if they don't like it? As a matter of fact, when I sent out the early versions, I got from people that I knew would be critical. I got some very critical feedback. They're not my typical audience, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to hear what they had to say. Hey, uh, it kind of desensitized me, I think, but, uh, but it, it's hard. And then you think, well, you know, I don't want to speak up because somebody's not going to like it. And, but at the end of the day, we have to have a strong enough or stronger enough will to make an impact and to care more about the bigger picture than we do about our ego or ourselves. So. I try to check that ego in and stick it in the drawer and say, hey, I'll see you later. Let's just, you know, be a little vulnerable, but in service of the greater good. Yeah. I think there's something else there. Sometimes I think we feel like we're, we're searching for the right answer to everything when maybe it's just this big pool of thought. You know, we're all just trying to, to um survive and move forward and make the world a better place and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, none of our books, none of our thoughts that come out are going to be perfect. We have to be able to, to interact and yeah, exactly. So anyway, I just, that was, I love that you brought that up at the beginning. That's fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just fun. It's, it's meaningful. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we talked a lot about having a growth mindset, Penny, what is the difference between I mean, a growth mindset and a reset mindset. Well, and this is one of the areas that, that scares me a little bit because, uh, you know, uh, Carol Dweck probably wouldn't like me talking about this, but, um, and I'm totally talking in honor of her work. I want that to be clear. It, this builds on top of the amazing work 
that she's done. There's been study after study that says that we are more productive, we perform better as an organization when we lead uh, and and work with a growth mindset. So the difference is the way that um, very high level for those who don't know. So Carol Dweck in 2006 wrote the book Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And it was, she described a fixed mindset, which is a mindset that believes that we can't change anything. Um, it It is the way it is and that we have very little uh, control. So we kind of just go, meh, there's nothing I can do about that. And she said the the growth mindset is one that learns to grow and to learn and appreciate, you know, and, and be more adaptable in that context. So it's uh, it's learning and adapting over time. And I think that's the key element over time. And she also talks very specifically about effort and persistence as part of that learning process. So where I introduce the reset mindset is building it on top of that. We want to have a growth mindset and seeing how dynamic the world is that we live in today and how quickly things are changing. Our roles are changing, our behaviors are changing, the marketplace is changing. We need to be more adaptable real time. So the reset mindset brings us to, it's taking a growth mindset and instead of effort and persistence, we're going to get, uh, we're going to shorten the learning cycles and we're going to get our feedback. It's about feedback loops and real time, that real time feedback that we can learn and adapt as we go, like in the moment. Um, or at least more in the moment that we do than we do now, if that makes sense. I mean, it can be momentarily or it can be over a period of time, but um, the, we want to shorten that and make it so that we're recognizing where there's an opportunity to to reset our thinking, to reset our approach in the marketplace. And, you know, coming back to the voice element is that so important that people speak up and share the feedback that, you know, what's their opinion and how do they see things changing and growing? Because it's all of those voices and that feedback that helps us to get perspective uh, when very often leaders or groups get stuck in the way we've always done things. And, and then we lose sight of the big picture or the future that we're working towards. And, and we, uh, we might get there, but it would take us a lot longer with a lot more effort and persistence. And wouldn't it be cool if we didn't have to work so hard, we didn't have to burn ourselves out in order to get there. We could just actually slow down, pay attention and adapt more quickly to the feedback. And then it's less effort and less stress. Well, and it sounds like you're talking about these micro changes, not just waiting and waiting and waiting for something until you realize you have to make a big change. Yes. It could be micro changes. Um, it's it's everything from so I I call the the micro changes or or the micro um, uh, reflection points. I call these reset moments, right? And so that would give us the opportunity when we recognize these reset moments. They're kind of the events that happen that have us recognize it's time to reset, and then it sets off a reset practice. Um, so. It could be those micro changes. Uh, it could also be that there's a big change that's needed because we didn't do the micro changes. Um, sure. Or, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think in, you know, in which context, you know, because sometimes we recognize things. Uh, the, the way I talk about it is the more that we practice these reset moments and engage in them in the little moments, the more we're going to also be able to use them more fully in the bigger moments. Yeah, sure. And at first, you're going to recognize it after it happened because we're building a muscle, right? It becomes muscle memory. At first, I'm only noticing it afterwards. Maybe something simple. It's a conversation that went wrong. I noticed it afterwards. I, said, oh, um, I really screwed that up. I said something that was really hurtful. And now that person's not talking to me. And we're recognizing they're not talking to me. So, okay. <laughs> the, and if you say, well, how can I remedy this, right? And then, and then you engage in, in this reset practice of stepping back, getting some perspective, and then realigning around what you need to do next to 
to reach your goal, which might be to mend that relationship. But what is going to happen the more you practice it is that you're then going to recognize it while it's going. Oh, did I just say that? And then you can correct it in the moment and say, oh, I didn't mean that. Let me rephrase that. Or, um, you know, let me explain what I mean by that. Right. So you, you recognize it in the moment as it came out of your mouth. And then the more we practice it, we're going to recognize it before it actually comes out of our mouth. And we're going to say, think in our head, the bubble goes. And then we go, no, 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 no. wrong thing to say. That's a process of how this becomes uh, and brings us to be able to do those those micro changes. Right. But at mm -hmm. first, it might not be. Yeah. Well, I wonder if you could give us some examples of some reset moments since you know, you're talking about maybe saying the wrong thing. Maybe there's some other thing, examples that you want to give us? Uh, sure. You know, it could be a, a conflict in a, in a discussion. It could be you're passed over for a promotion, right? As opposed to getting emotional about it. Um, of course, we will at first, but as quickly as possible, go, okay, um, you know, step back, get perspective and realign. Take that as a reset moment to see, okay, what what went well and what didn't go well, and how do I set myself up for success in the future, right? So that that might be one thing. So, um, you know, like for instance, I when I first started speaking, um, I was declined for a speaking role that I had uh, applied for. And then I could have said, I'm not right for this. Mm. I, should, I should give up speaking because this organization declined me. So who else is gonna want me to, to come and speak? you know, for them and so forth. Right. But I, I, I didn't, I, I stepped back and said, okay, where do I need to build skills and how do I need to prepare and so on and so forth. Right. Um, let's think of some smaller ones. Uh, I mean, relationships and communication are, are really big ones. Yeah. Um, it could be when you get up in the morning and you had all the good intentions to get up early and to work out and then to go and, and do the things that you have scheduled for the day. But maybe you hit the snooze and that then caused everything. You ended up getting up late and then you were rushed and, you know, you didn't even have time for breakfast. You got to work and you were hungry, right? And so that, that catapulted the whole day. So a reset moment could be, hey, that really didn't work well for me. That created a lot of stress. So we can then in these reset moments, use some tools. We could say, okay, well, um, I could set a rule for myself that I set what time I'm going to go to bed the night before. So I pre-decide when I do that. And I call these gatekeepers. When we pre-decide and set a rule and say, I set it the night before and I honor whatever I set. So if I said I was going to get up and work out, even if I only got three hours of sleep, if that's what I determined the night before, then I'm going to honor that and I'm going to get up. So, um, you know, so then that reset moment could be when the alarm goes off, you know that you set a rule that you're going to get up and then you don't hit snooze and you actually get up and do what was planned. So mm. you, you see what I mean? So yeah, yeah. My first thought is it sounds like a way to recognize that something isn't what you want it to be. You didn't get the result that you wanted. So you do a little bit of, you know, thinking, reflection, analysis, and then make an intentional decision about how you're going to move forward. And you've created this process to make it simple for people to do that. And to remember that this is not just a, it's not just one thing that you do every once in a while, but you can just live like this. You can go through life with that mindset so that you're always thinking more intentionally and reflectively. Yes. Imagine yeah. how much like how, how much better we would feel, how much more meaning our life would have, how much deeper our relationships would be. Right. If, if yeah. we were just able to be more intentional, I think today more than ever is that we need to adopt tools like this mm -hmm. simple you know, uh, and then they have to be simple because otherwise we won't we won't do it. If it's a 10 step plan, you know, forget it um, because we're being bombarded with things that want to take our attention uh, in different directions. And and then we're not going to reach our goals. We're not going to have the depth of relationships that we want. We're just going to be scrolling and binging shows. And and those are all great. But, you know, they keep us sometimes from the very things that we want. 
Right. I I mean, I know that there are, I know that one of the things that we all want is to feel like we matter. And so we want to matter. We want to, we want to be able to know that we can make a difference of some kind. And instead of looking at these difficulties or these challenging or these failures or whatever you want to call them, these moments where you feel like you have failed, um, instead of looking at those with failure, to be able to look at them with a reset mindset, you're saying, hey, you've got agency. You can you can build this. You can you can create um, more credibility or more more energy or more um, impact by doing it a different way. You just have to you, you get to keep learning and growing and experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't. And that's a good thing. It is a great thing. I mean, think about it. We're in the, the, the day of video games, right? We don't even think twice when we uh, fail to get to the, to the second level. We die, we get shot down, whatever happens, right? And then we're like, great, we get back in it. The first level's easy, right? Because we've done it before. Nah. And now we're trying to figure out the second one. And it's a game to yes. figure out how we get there. So what if we just use this reset mindset to help us to... to play with it a little bit and just recognize it's just feedback, right? And 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 I get it. I mean, I'm not saying that I never take things personally. I, I am actually a very sensitive person and I take a lot of things personally, but I reframe them. Mm-hmm. Even even something as as big as, you know, the situation of of my divorce many years ago, it's very personal. It felt very personal. But I was able to very quickly, because I practiced this for many years, not even knowing that, that I was practicing this, I was able to say he didn't mean it to be personal. So it, it felt personal, but when I could detach that and say that wasn't his intention, it wasn't to hurt me. Of course, it was, you know, whatever um, the situation is, but I think we can, we can assume that people aren't out to get us. We mm. can that things happen that that aren't good on either side like I've been in plenty of contracts and relationships I was in an investment and uh you know unfortunately the person who was the builder of that investment because it was real estate died in the middle of the project so all the intentions that were set together um weren't 100 percent clear on paper and when their family took over their family tried to um, get the best possible situation that they could for them, which you have to understand, right? When you put someone else's hat on, you can say, okay, I get that. They're not intentionally trying to, that doesn't mean I'm not going to fight for, you know, what was rightfully mine and what was intended. But I, I think that that key is that if we can just detach from that emotion a little bit, that's, that's what the reset mindset helps us to do is, is to create a little detachment so we can not let emotion derail us. Either, you know, elation, it can also be like really great emotion, right? Or, or heavy emotion. If we can really see things more objectively, then we can really review all the different um, options. And I've always found that in any kind of negotiation, because I can do that and, and not take it personally, we come up with a win-win situation almost every time. Like that particular investment situation it went back and forth but because we didn't lose our cool and we didn't say things that were hurtful and appreciating they were also going through a difficult time they just lost a family member we we worked it out um we may have needed a little legal help but we worked it out (laughs) yeah that's great so um if you don't mind i'd like to read a quote from your book i'd love to hear what what stuck out for you yeah um so on page 109, um, you were talking about somebody at work and he was starting to feel pressure. So it's, this is the quote. His day began with an influx of emails from both project teams, each marking their tasks as urgent. Ethan felt the pressure mounting. This was his reset moment number one, prioritize first. Instead of diving headfirst into the task, he took a moment to breathe and prioritize. So I guess my question for you is, how did prioritizing help Ethan? How can we apply that sort of thing to 
when we're feeling mounting pressure? Well, I think from my studies, I've interviewed a number of different people, um, thousands of people, and and I have come up with about um, what's the the latest number that I saw was seventy three percent of people say that their biggest stressor is competing priorities. Right. So just what you're saying, Ethan was experiencing. Everybody said it was it was urgent, um, and so problem is is that it means we don't have priorities because prioritize first means that we have to have a clear criteria that helps us to say this is more important than that and we tend to just take it all on and then go i'll just deal with it i'll figure it out um so what people need to do is first to identify what is their criteria how do they determine what is more important than than other things. And very often it is this this gray thing when you're working in teams. So as a team, it's important that the group defines how do we define urgency first of all together? What is truly urgent so we can avoid the false urgencies that are just because I want to get it off my plate that I'm going to take this hot potato and I'm going to pass it to you and now you've got the hot potato. Um that doesn't work, right? So, but when you have a criteria, then I can know when you send me an email when this is due. So if we use the subject line, for instance, and we've got some agreement, we could say this particular issue is a hot issue. It's due within 24 hours. Um, You know, this particular issue, I'm handing it over to you, but it's not due until the end of the week, right? We can actually put that in the subject line so somebody can scroll and very quickly see, okay, I have to do this first, right? So, so it's coming up with with these types of predefining these these elements to make life easier. Kind of like a good example is if you go to the emergency room. They're not there like, oh, should I? Ha- I'm not sure. This person is screaming and crying and this person is. They have a clear criteria on how they uh, bring you in and, and based on your severity is, you know, uh, are you bleeding out? You go first, right? That person who might be crying might be in pain, but not bleeding out. So, right, we we have to, again, take the emotion out of it and then say, what is our criteria so we can focus on the execution? Mm, Yeah. When you're talking about taking the emotion out of it, it sounds a little bit like when I talk about, like, not being reactive. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. So like because right, our first reaction might be uh, emotional. It might be that we've made an assumption about what this means and it means something different. It might be we choose very often the easiest solution versus the best solution. So just taking that, that moment to pause and, and get a little perspective uh, can make all the difference to optimizing how we're using our times and really stay focused on the right things. Okay, another quote that I really really appreciate is um there's no more powerful force within our control than the ability to assign meaning oh okay so what do you mean by that and why should we be asking the question what does this mean so in the book for those who are listening i'm not going to go through what that is but i had a big aha uh moment that i share in the book around that that question what does this mean But ultimately, the discovery for me was that's the question that we ask ourselves every moment as things are happening around us. We ask ourselves, what does this mean? And we, like you said, we react with an answer. And that answer isn't always the most productive or supportive answer, right? It means that person is disrespecting me. It means that um, I'm going to lose my job if I, if I, speak up on this particular topic. It means, right, we're, we're making all these assumptions. And so asking ourselves, what else could this mean? And what else could this mean? Opens us up to have perspective, to choose the best meaning uh, for the situation and for you. So like you have like this initial, this is what I think this means. But then you start to ask, wait, 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 okay, if I reset, if I stop and think about this a little bit though what else Mm -hmm. could this mean 
or yep. what what other perspective do I need to bring into this to to know that there could be something some other kind of meaning to it too, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's say a friend um, says something really not very nice to you, um, barks at you or something, or somebody at work, right? So you could give that meaning uh, of you know this person is doesn't get me, isn't they don't like me, no close to them anymore. They don't like me exactly at work, especially, or they think my work is crap or you know, whatever, um, maybe they're just having a bad day. Mm. Like you don't know what just happened in their life, that it has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on there. They just blew up because they just had a bad meeting with a client and the client yelled at them. And, you know, so they're highly emotional. So, so it just gives us space. You know, uh, Victor Frankl talked about the space between stimulus and response. So I like to say that I named that space as the reset moment. Yeah. And it's in that space that we define meaning, right? Yeah. Is, and so it is the most powerful uh, source within our control because we can decide what that means to us. And my brother is, comes from a very different place. And he's like, well, that's, you know, that's ridiculous, you know, but I live in a different way than he lives because I can see, so I don't get as emotion. I don't get upset at as many things and um, I don't see people out to get me or if, if a business, something doesn't work or somebody doesn't reciprocate to me, that's okay. It'll come back some other way, right? So, um, or it won't, whatever. Like, I, you know, I gave because I was happy to give. I think it enables us to live happier lives. And if everybody just, could reduce the intensity, right? And and just pay attention to the meaning that they're giving things, right? Then then we'd be programming ourselves for more positivity, more um, purposefulness. And actually, I want to say this is not, people might say, oh, that's toxic positivity. It's not. It's intentionality. You mentioned the word earlier. It's about being more intentional about how we want to show up how we feel about things, um, who we want to be, and how we want to interact with the world. And I, I think it's more about intentionality than it is about positivity. I think that's fair. Can you define just toxic positivity for the audience, the person listening? So I'm not an expert in that sure. space. I understand it to be that, like that that people are just, oh, you know, the world is, is everybody's perfect. And, uh, you know, maybe we just lost the best client, you know, that, that is supporting the organization and we go, oh, that's okay. Everything will be great. It's almost denial. So, well, yeah, I guess almost a denial is how I understand it to be. And not, um, and not, and not assigning when you're talking about meaning too, like understanding the impact, like denying the impact of something potentially too. Like just saying it's okay when it's not okay is not okay. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it, right? Is that um, I think that when you are assigning meaning, you are, you're not being positive and you're not denying the impact, but you're allowing yourself to work with the situation in a more productive way. Because it, it doesn't work when you deny impact, then you're, you're kind of pushing stuff in and pushing it down. But it's also not doom and gloom, like we're going to close our doors. And what what it does is when we assign meaning that's more productive, it makes us more resourceful. And that's mm -hmm. the goal of the reset mindset is that we allow ourselves to be in connection with our intuition, with our creativity, with the gifts that we have within us. And when we are, uh, you know, really seeing gloom and doom, or assuming the worst, or, you know, I can't do this, or, or those types of things, we're actually shutting off ourselves from our own resourcefulness. Mm. It sounds like it would also be beneficial for um, being open to other perspectives, other potential reasons for things. Like, yeah, yeah, like, I, you know, and I think about political divisions. Um, ideological divisions. A lot of times we do this us versus them and this um, 
uh, the other side is evil or whatever. But to be able to say this is actually like I, I'm willing to acknowledge that they might have a really good reason for whatever they're doing. Okay, pardon my interruption, but at this point in the conversation with Penny, I realized that I had not plugged in my microphone and I had this reaction. I was like, oh no, what am I doing? I forgot to plug in my microphone. So she recommended that we leave this in, but the audio wasn't very good at that point. So our conversation from this point is about my reaction to realizing that I hadn't plugged in my microphone. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. That was, okay. that was definitely very reactive. <laughs> no, you can't deny it in the moment. It's like, <laughs> oh, no. oh, oh. so we move on. Let's reset. Okay. Reset. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Well, you can even leave that in, right? I mean, it's That's totally, um, it, it is life that something doesn't go the way as planned. And it's, the question is, is how long do you stay there? Yeah. Right? Do you, do you let it uh, upset you for an hour, for two hours, for three hours, the whole day, for the whole week, right? Or do you just, or do you just say, okay, here's how we're going to handle this. And, you know, just going to let the whole thing you know, go in this tone. So it's it's really about the duration and 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 reducing the duration of that reaction. It, and and getting to a point where you're not reacting, you're responding. But but there are situations where you just are gonna react. It's yeah. human. Yeah, the duration and the ability to bounce back quicker, the ability to make changes quicker. This is about resilience. It's about agility. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. The power of constraints. I I am very interested to hear you tell us about the power of constraints and why maybe they're not all bad. Like what what is a constraint? Let's just kind of like give some context for that constraint. I mean, you know, we could look at the big constraint, like COVID was a huge constraint. Right. And uh, we were in lockdown, like it was a huge constraint. It changed the way, you know, from one day to the next, you know, restaurants couldn't function the way that they did. Hospitals, you know, like everything was affected. It was a huge constraint. But it was also a huge catalyst. And I think that we often see the constraint and get lost and stuck in the constraint without being able to recognize that, hey, there's a huge opportunity, a catalyst. I mean, we have, we, we made advancements in um, technology and in, in different business models that probably without that constraint wouldn't have been made for 20 years, right? Uh, but we allowed it to happen. I mean, telemedicine was, was just not something that was being accepted. I, I had a friend who was a social worker and I remember saying to her, you can take your notes online like while you're talking to someone on an iPad, it would help you because they complain about, you know, how much time it takes to write the notes and then to put them into the computer. And she was like, no, that would never happen. I could never do uh, and meet with someone and, and give them this kind of care online. Well, boom, now they can do it. And she was like, oh my God, I never thought that this would be possible. So because of the constraint, it opened people up to realize, well, we have to do things differently. Yeah. We cannot do them the same way because the constraint doesn't allow us to. So it forces us to get creative and find new ways. The, the problem sometimes is there's that, you know, people are talking about the messy middle, um, is that it's not enough of a constraint to really force you into creative thinking. It's, there's not enough pressure or, you know what I mean, to, to, to force that. So we kind of get um, just like, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do. Like, we just have to work, over, you know, within it. And, and that's not true, right? I, I do a lot of different exercises and workshops and events that I do, and I help people to see how these constraints can really bring out very interesting ways of, of looking at things and creativity and collaboration and cooperation right? brings people together. So, um, you know, I, I suggest next time that somebody says, I can't do that, or, uh, 
you know, this is in the way, you know, looking at your obstacle and, and, and thinking about how that can make you more creative, right? And saying, yeah. well, how else could we do this? And how might we achieve X? And what if we did Y? I mean, how could it shape a new, a new solution? Yeah. I mean, we have a, a completely new business model because the largest transportation company in the world does not own a single vehicle. Is that crazy? Who would have thought that that type of business model would even be possible, right? But Uber came up with a new way of looking at things uh, by asking different questions and by just saying, what if we did this? You know, how could we decrease, you know, the largest risk that we have if we're a transportation company, right? So it's, we just have to get better at asking uh, questions to help us to be more creative. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's good stuff there. I was thinking about your audience and your message about, you know, using your voice and being influential. Sure. And so I want to just go back to the catalyst point, which is, you know, goes to this question as well, which is, you know, if you want to own your, your voice and you want to have an influence, you have to be open to challenging people and in a positive way. Not in a, you did that, why did you do that, right? But saying, giving, but putting into the group, what if we looked, what if we took 10 minutes and we explored another, other perspectives or other ways of looking at things? Be that person that challenges other, other people, that opens up perspective and opportunity, right? So if we want to do that, even though it's scary to, to say, I don't understand. I don't think this will work. Do it anyway for the greater good. So I just wanted to add that because um, that's the way we we grow and create opportunity and really influence others is that we help to 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 challenge them. Sure. Um, okay. If you were to talk to us right now about okay, look, this is this is what it means to have a reset mindset, and these are the two or three things that you can do that's going to that's going to really make a difference for you in the future. And obviously we've already talked about some things. So I'm just kind of wondering what you would say at this point. Like what's important for us to like adopt to have a reset mindset. So I have a a, a number of principles in the book that talk about sort of these beliefs that you hold when you have a reset mindset. Uh so one of them is that change is constant is that change is not something to fear. Change is something to dance with. Like we talked a little bit about earlier, you know, as playing a video game and just knowing that it's, it's inevitable and it's happening all around us. And so we can, you know, we can, we can be more open to it. So that, that's an, a very important thing. I also think that we need to get better at, feedback. There's, there's a number of areas in the book where I talk about feedback. So these reset moments are about taking in feedback, recognizing feedback, but also giving feedback. And we're not very good, I think, at, at either, right? We're not good at, at slowing down to take some time to ask ourselves some questions. And even, for instance, I see after a project, you know, there's no time we need to move on to the next thing. So they don't do a debrief. What if you just got in the habit of doing a debrief for yourself every day and saying, what went, went well today? What didn't? And I have a little uh, 135 daily planner that I use that helps me plan the day. Um, and then that's on the left side of the sheet. And then on the right side of the sheet is what I do to reflect at the end of the day to say, what were my wins? So that I don't get lost in what I didn't do, because that used to happen to me as an overachiever. I would just focus on the what I didn't do list. So I'm like, OK, well, what were some of my wins? I, you know, let me go through some of the things that I can realize that I actually was making progress. It just wasn't necessarily all the things that were on my on my list. So what were those wins? Uh, what were some of the reset moments that I could learn from that I missed? You know, those types of things. What were some of the distractions that I need to better handle? in the future. And, uh, and what am I grateful for? I like to start and end the day with, with gratitude because I think that it sets the tone and energy 
in in a you know stress compounds so the reset moments taken throughout the day and also with this the start of the day and at the end of the day right we can offset that by by taking these smaller moments just to um, to slow down and take a few breaths to go outside and go for a walk to you know walk up and down the stairs a couple of times whatever it is and right in the middle of what you're doing right so um it's just my whole thing is make more reset this has been great penny i know that people can get your productivity zone book they can listen to your energy of thought um ted talk um get the reset mindset book where can people find these things find you and just so you know we will put things on our show of course of course well right now you know we're celebrating the launch of the reset mindset so you can go to the resetmindset.net that's where you can sort of uh see a quick video from me and you see all the outlets of course you can go to uh barnes and noble amazon books a million wherever but uh, i also have some special bonuses if you go to the resetmindset.net and you put in there your purchase order, um, you'll get access to some other goodies that are only available uh, until the end of the launch period. So until the end of September, they'll be able to connect with me over LinkedIn and and my website will be connected to that. Sounds good. And um, so my last question for you is what last piece of advice do you want to give someone who wants to have a voice of influence? I think we'll come back to what I said in the beginning. Just Take that reset moment when you're trying to talk yourself out of it, right? So when you hear yourself say anything that talk, that's trying to talk yourself out of it and break that pattern, then shift that and reframe it to say, no, I need to do it. I need to speak up for myself, for others, uh, for the greater good. Well, thank you so much for being Voice of Influence today for our audience. I appreciate you taking time. This is exciting. Congratulations on your book and good luck. 